Welcome everyone to um, the uh, Colour Through Time Symposium. I'm really delighted that, um, that you've managed to fight through the traffic, the heat, London, uh, Brexit to, to, to be here. Um, and uh, our first speaker of the day, I'm very honoured um, to have um, Professor Tom McLeish. Um, Tom and I met um, up in York um, and had a fantastic conversation. Um, and he, at the time, was, was, was showing an interest in artists and art. Um, and uh, he did mention, I think, that you, there, there, there was a book in the, uh, in, in, in the um, wings. Um, and Tom has um, produced a fantastic uh, book, which I'm reading to find it really extraordinary information, wonderful insights called um, Poetry, Music and Science. Um, and um, Tom, you are one of the most, um, you are a hero to me. Your wonderful um, accolades uh, uh, <laughs> managed to, uh, the, 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 the <laughs> the Natural uh, Science Chair at uh, York University. So um, without further ado, as they say, um, can I look at you? Thank you. 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 Thank I'm a science, actually it's the Chair of Natural Philosophy at York, which is lovely because that's what science used to be called, and I think science should be called natural philosophy. And again, we live in far too fragmentary a world. Um, oh, yeah, that's what I do have also demonstrated, yeah. And actually, just published last week, so it's a good, it's a good coincidence, the poetry and music of science, actually. It's the poetry and music of science. Of science. So um, I'm, um, it's the book I wanted to write for a long, long time about um, the commonalities in the hu deeply human process, which is to create things, which is something that scientists and artists deeply share. Um, I, but it isn't actually talk about the book. Uh, it's talk about colour and medieval, theory, uh, medieval theories of colour. And as it says here, um, no, I'm going to turn this around a little bit so you folks want to see. Um, Oh, sorry, we're, we're trying to keep it for the... Uh, oh, I do think you're... Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> sorry, everyone out there, media world, I'll be back, but these people will just have to watch that one or something. Anyway, there we go. Is that all right? Um, this is a project called the Order Universe Project. It's a collaboration between the Universities of Durham, York, and Oxford. And it also, like the book about art, music, and science, it's, it's actually an exemplification of that. It's putting the unity back in the academic project. It's bringing scientists and medieval scholars, including theologians, historians, philosophers, together to dig deeply into the visual thinking of uh, and the visual natural philosophy of the 13th century over 800 years of distance um, and finding that scientists today not only can help unpeel the hidden layers of that ancient thinking, but the quantitative and scientific parts of them, but also uh, that uh, thinking from that age can, can stimulate and inspire new science today. Uh, so, um, here's our hero, by the way, um, of the 13th century polymath, gosh, uh, uh, Dee mentioned um, uh, a polymath, I take my hat off, or my mitre off, because I don't have to this cap. He became later, actually, Bishop of Lincoln, that's why the mitre is on. He um, taught the Oxford Franciscans in the 1220s, um, came from very humble origins, Robert Grosset was his name, an extraordinary learned uh, scholar of the early 1200s. Um, he, that's his little biography, he probably went to Paris, he was in Hereford, he uh, um, became Bishop of Lincoln and, 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 and dies after leading two um, missions to, to the Pope on behalf of those church politics stuff. Uh, he wrote treaties on all aspects of nature during those years from about 1215 to 1225. He wrote about light, colour, sound, the spheres, comets, lines and places, extraordinary subtle thinking. So subtle, in fact, that to unpick it, we've needed a rather large team. I mentioned a few things. We have historians, theologians. This is the ordered universe uh, team, paleographers. 
philologists, medieval Latinists, Arabists, very important because he was one of the first to read the great Arab Muslim scholars of the early medieval centuries that passed Aristotle on, commentated to the European West, English studies, classics, history of science, philosophy, and so it goes on, engineering, computer science. All these people are represented, and we need a whole team in, uh, in uh, the year 2019 to unpick the thinking of one person in 1225. Just to give you a little bit of a, a roundup of the ordered universe project or the various directions in which we take it, we now have we gave for about ten years. Um, it's largely supported by um, a, a, a number of private donations, also Pembroke College, Oxford, and uh, a, a large grant from the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, and we have uh, produced. We've done the normal humanities thing. We're editing texts. Um, Latin texts, we're translating them into the English. Do come and sit on a really comfortable chair, don't stand there for anything. Um, these are very nice, I've tried them myself. And, um, uh, but we're also producing new science, we're all t uh, there's a lot of, uh, we produce exhibitions and public shows, we've spawned artists have been inspired, there are about four or five artists who joined our project between the humanities scholars and scientists and have produced artwork We'll talk about that at that, that, that question time, including the Sunderland Art Centre. Um, Alexandra Carr, who's a London based artist, <coughs> whose uh, lovely illustration, um, uh, Imperium, is on the front cover of the book that he showed you just, just there. And we have about 10 publications in scientific journals today of brand new science whose first reference is R. Gross Test 1222, so that's a better turn off the books. Um, I, I mentioned his. Um, his writing. Uh, these are on the right hand side there, after a bit of his scientific uh, biography on the left, the right hand side are the treaties we have from Gross Test on, um, on scientific topics. He starts off talking about sound and then treats the sphere, um, the six differences of place, that's a wonderful one, comments, and then, then he becomes fascinated on light and colour. And that topic of the day and also treats the rainbow. to this conflict. It's a pond of day color in color in that manuscript. So um, he hook line line and, and sink. In fact, in our little edition of um, uh, of De Colori, we have as well an edition and translation of Bartholomeus's early English work too. So let's jump straight into De Colori uh, on colour, about, about 1220. Here we go. Starts off with this great Latin sentence, lux color est lux incorporata perspicuo. Uh, colour is light embodied or incorporated in a perspicuum, that's by the way not a classical ancient uh, Latin word, it's a medieval Latin word, it means some sort of translucent body in around 1200. By 1300, a perspicuum means a lens, which tells you how the technology and the language of the 13th century interacted and how fast things were moving back then. Not the only dark thing about the Dark Ages is our ignorance of them. So I've come to respect these centuries hugely. Uh, without going on, we haven't got time to go line by line, I'd love to take you line by line through this extraordinary text. It's almost poetic in its tightness of form. It is, in fact, a very mathematical text, and that was why, by the way, having theoretical physicists <laughs> Crudely speaking, we can't read it until someone translates the Latin for us. Um, when you have the combinatorics of a three-dimensional abstract space, uh, the sort of skill you need to recognize that is not typically possessed by those who end up as career uh, Latin sc scholars. So you see how this works. The text identifies three bipolar qualities of color. Gross test says that light, all light sits between purum impure, pure impure, it also, it also moves between the clear and the obscure, or the bright and dim, clara obscura. And thirdly, it moves between the great and the scarce, the copious or the scarce, multa and palca. So there are these um, axes, one end of which is impure to pure, and a color will be somewhere on that axis. There's a second axis, there's a third axis. Um, the first two, the purity and the clarity, are 
he declares property to do with the light itself. I beg your pardon. The f that's, I beg your pardon. The purity and impurity is to do with the body the light is in. He notices you only ever perceive color when there's a substantial body there. And, and, and his idea that color emerges from the interaction of light with, with body, with matter, with stuff, that resonates with his metaphysics of light itself, which is in a whole other text we haven't got time to go into today. Beautiful text on light, De Luce, um, uh, in which he, he sees light collaborating with atoms to provide us with the substance and extension of matter that we, as we observe it today. Um, however, these second two pairs, the clear obscure pair and the great dim pair, they're the properties of light itself. I should say, by the way, the sort of manuscripts that are in not altogether in a very good way. Um, this is one of the chief manuscript uh, transmissions of this little um, uh, treatise on colour, rather badly damaged in the fire of London in 1666. Now, what is remarkable, you know immediately what is remarkable about reading a 13th century manuscript that describes all colours as being somewhere along three independent axes of quality. What's remarkable about that is because that is our current understanding of colour. That is why this screen and this cable has a red and a green and a blue signal channel. All colours can, in fact, be described or achieved by mixing uh, different quantities of the three primaries, red, green, and blue. Now, Grostes isn't doing that. He's got three other axes. But you see, I can describe three-dimensional space um, in terms of left, right, up, down, and in, out in an arbitrary rotation of, of, of axes. Finally, I've got three. Why do we have, briefly, why do we have three um, axes for colour? Why does colour live in a three-dimensional space? Thomas Young... Uh, great um, 18th, 19th century, again, a polymath, a physicist, Young's fringes, um, uh, Young's modulus, but also the first person to have a go at cracking the code of Egyptian hieroglyphs um, at Emmanuel College, Cambridge, and then London, guessed correctly that the reason that colour, all colours can be achieved by mixing three paints or three colours, is because our retinas, our eyes, have three different independent colour-sensitive cells. They are famously the cone cells of our retinas. And here we are. Uh, at the top there, we have an arbitrary spectral decomposition against wavelength. I've got intensity of light against wavelength. That's an infinite dimensional space for the mathematical feature aficionados. That's projected down into a three-dimensional space because the, the wavelength sensitivity is given by those three curves underneath, the red, the green, and the blue. Note how close the red and green are to each other. I'm always surprised by this. Those curves aren't equally spaced. Red and green are quite close. And then the short wavelength codes. So they get, they get transferred into uh, neural firing rates for the long, the medium, and the short wavelength codes, and those are three numbers. So our optical nerve from the retina carries, in a coded form, three numbers to our visual cortex. For every pixel we're looking at, that's color. There's physics in the, out, uh, out in the world, in the spectrum, and there's physiology in the projection onto three dimensions. And there at the back of the retina they go, and there is a little map of uh, the cells of a hugely magnified map of the retina at the back of our eye from Hannah Smith's in Oxford, my, my colleague who works on this. And she's, uh, Hannah has colored in um, the short wavelength cones as blue and the medium wavelength cones as green and the long wavelength cones as red. And you can see there's rather a random matrix. Um, and that is how we perceive color. So one can, in abstract, plot color, if you like, in this abstract cube. Um, it's mathematically equivalent to those three dimensions being the x, y, or z, or left, right, inner, up, down coordinates. And you can plot inside that cube the L cone, the long, long wavelength signal, the medium wavelength signal, and the short wavelength signal. When all are firing at once, I've got lots of red, lots of green, and lots of blue. What do I have? Have white. Have white. It's have white. And that is why white is in the top is in the top right-hand corner of that cube there. That's when I've got, I've got maximum amount of L and M and S. If I turn it all off, I've got no light 
in the red or no light in the green and no light in the blue, what have I got? I've got black. That's why there's a black dot there. So black is in the opposite corner. And, you know, red and green and blue are in the first corners and I can get mixes. And so, in fact, let's have a look at, let's fill in the color cube. Now we're filling in the color cube and you can see the red corner and the green corner and the blue only corner. And I've got grays and through up to whites uh, coming towards me in, in, in the middle and all colors in between. I've got the cyans and the purples in between the reds and the blues. And so there's color, all colors filling a three-dimensional space as we understand it today, as is coming through this signal there, the RGB signal. We know that Gross test has a structure like that in mind because he starts doing combinatorics. It wouldn't have been quite enough to have shown this just because there are three independent quantities. He starts counting colors. It also follows, he writes, from this statement, there are seven colors close to whiteness, no more, no fewer. Well, what does he mean by that? Um, uh, he says, well, look, there's, there's Gross test cube. Now, I've not got red, I've not, it's not red, green, blue anymore. This is the Gross test cube with impurum purum, yeah, on the one axis, Clara obscura on another axis, and multi power car on the other axis. These chairs are ever so much more comfortable. Come over here and you'll see the screens too. It's not, not to like, promise you. And you, uh, we're very informal here. Don't sit on a table, I'll, I'll feel uncomfortable. Um, so what he says is, he says is, look, I can start from white. I'll show you why there are seven colors I can go to from white. Here's, here's why. Of my three quantities, greatness, purity, clarity, I can hold, they're all one, one, one. They're all at maximum at white, okay? I can hold two of them constant and reduce just one, okay? And that gets me three colors. And I, I hope you can see I've just colored in red from the white corner of the cube, there are red lines, and I'm just reducing one of those quantities at a time. I'm going down the, the three edges of the cube that meet at white. Then he says, or I can hold just one of those three qualities constant, and I can reduce simultaneously the other two. What that does, if I'm, if I'm reducing two of the three at a time, and if you can see this geometrically in that little cube, that's equivalent to moving diagonally across one of the three faces that meet at the white corner. That's three more colors, three more directions in color space. It's not bad for 12, 24, is it, really? And you can guess where the seventh one comes from now, can't you? Or, he says, I can reduce them all at the same time. And that comes straight across the diagonal from white to black. So those are the seven color directions from, from white. So now we know, we've nailed it, right? This is equivalent to that mathematics of the three-dimensional abstract space. Um, and so we would, now, we would now label these coordinates for with a, in a Cartesian convention like 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so forth, and we would plot all the colors. Now, the point is, this is, this is different. Now, I'm, I'm supposed to be the first talk. I know Dee really wanted this to be um, uh, to be a uh, uh, chronological, didn't you? Now, it is going to be chronological because this is where we go to Aristotle. Of course, you can only understand medieval science, high medieval science, by going to Aristotle because the whole reason that the 12th century got going is because of the transmission into Northern Europe from the Arab philosophers, the great Muslim Arab philosophers, of Aristotle's philosophy in all sorts of uh, uh, partitions of nature, into Europe in Arabic. So very often Aristotle's works were first known not from Greek translations into Latin, but from Arabic translations into Latin. And one of them was this wonderful book, De Sensu et Sensato, which among which uh, many subjects contains Aristotle's theory of color. And against much of the history of science that would have us believe that the medieval scholars just wanted to recapitulate what the ancients had said, what Aristotle and Plato had said, Grostest is doing far more than this. He's exploding Aristotle's idea. Aristotle had the idea that the colors were on, effectively on a line between white and black. Um, and, and by moving up from white towards black, uh, or, or black towards white, one passes through blues and greens and reds and yellows all the way, all the way to white. Uh, Grostest, although he has colors emerging out from black, or descending down from white, they are not on a line. They're in this much richer manifold or richer space, this three-dimensional space. Uh, so this is something rather serious. But something else was rather serious and troubled us because this near mathematical poem of 400 words of Latin was so perfect, the flaw in the jewel stood out a mile. 
And it was very awkward. Because when Grustes talked... By the way, there are no colours mentioned in this treatise on colour. There are perfectly good medieval Latin words for red and purple and green. And, but they're not mentioned. Only white and black. However, when Grustes mentions white, he says white is, of course, multa, clara, pura, light. Great, clear, pure light. Three numbers for the 111 corner. So when he talks about black, which he does, you would expect him to say, well, you know what he's going to say now, don't you? It's paucar, little, impurum, and not clara, and the other one is obscurum, if you remember, obscure light. But that word obscure is not mentioned. Only two of the list of coordinate words are mentioned in the case of black. It's just an awkward, well, maybe the point is, maybe by the time you have no light at all, you don't need to qualify nothing. Perhaps he knows that. But it irked because the way he's going about writing this text on colour um, indicates he has a very clear idea that this three-dimensionality, as we would put it, is, is, is very substantial. So much so that we wondered whether it was a scribal error. Might it just, might it have been, you know, that, uh, so here we are. Here's, here's just uh, the, um, whoops, yeah, um, uh, the nine later, here we are, here's the manuscript. Lux igitur clara multa in perspicuo pura albedo est. That's, that's uh, uh, therefore light, clear, clear, great light in a pure body is white, right? But black looks palcar in perspicuo impuro nigredo est. Nigredo is the word for black. You've just got palcar there, impurum, you don't have obscurum. Now, what about the manuscript tradition? Well, uh, here is the so-called stemma codicum of this manuscript as it descends to us. The wonderful thing about pre-printed uh, copies is that, there, is that every scribe creates a, 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 a copy by a treatise, a manuscript, by copying it from either the original or another copy in front of him, typically him. Um, so any mistakes... He might make mistakes. In fact, he does make mistakes, particularly if he's not got his mind around what's in front of him. But any mistake that's already in the copy in front of him is almost certain to be copied. It's not going to be undone. Okay? So by tracing which manuscripts have which error, you can imagine you can do exactly what biologists and geneticists do to create, to create evolutionary trees, because manuscripts have evolutionary trees. Parent manuscripts have daughter manuscripts, and they carry their genetic code of errors with them. Right. So, so here we are. The, um, the manuscript that the current edition at that point was working on is right at the bottom hand corner. It's that V thing, the Venice. It's four or five branches down the tree, four or five generations of copying errors by, people, by readers who probably didn't know quite what they had their minds around. Unbeknown to the German editor Bauer in 1910, whose edition we were working from, there is in Madrid, on that left hand spur, a much earlier uh, tradition, M, uh, a manuscript of De Colore, which Bauer had not had access to. But my friend Giles had access to it because he was going to Madrid the summer we were doing this work. Would he like us to uh, look at the Madrid manuscript to see if perhaps the word obscura, making that list of three words for black, and thereby turning the thing into a mathematical perfection, was there. So this is cool. So by this methodology, you see, we have predicted that if my friend Giles goes to an obscure medieval library in Madrid, pulls out this manuscript and looks at line 15, he will see, and I haven't seen this manuscript, the word obscura there, if we are right about the mathematical mind that Grosteste had. And there is the Madrid manuscript. And there, where we said it would be, is the word obscura that the scribe at the top of that other tree of branch of manuscripts had just simply line skipped, and so all scribes have subsequently skipped. So at this point, this is what I call my our Da Vinci Code moment. You know, it's kind of, whoa, we're cooking with gas here. Something's, this, is, this methodology is doing something. Um, but you can see why, why philological scholarship doesn't pick this error up. There's nothing ungrammatical about this sentence. There's nothing that doesn't fit. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with saying black is, is um, a little... Uh, uh, and impure light. It's only when you have the mathematical global structure of the color space the text is describing that you identify something is wrong with that, with that sentence. So, um, 
uh, here we are. We've got this space. But the qu question that we have to question, we still haven't solved, and we have 10 minutes to solve it, is, is what does gross test mean by pure light, great light, clear light? You know, I want Doctor Who as my friend. I want to take a Dulux colour chart into the TARDIS, and I want to go back to Oxford, please, in the year 1224, and I want to, dear Dr. Grosstest, would you please, you know, tell me which of these colours you think is pure or clear or obscure or, or, or great. I, I want to orientate myself in your colour world. But we, unfortunately, just comes on at Saturday night, 5 o'clock, um, until we found our TARDIS. And the TARDIS is in another of Grosseteste's treatises. It's his, late, it's his last scientific treatise, his treatise on the rainbow, which is why the rainbow is so important for us. Because when Grosseteste talks about De Iride, the rainbow, he does talk about actual colours. There the colours come out towards the end of this text. And what is more, he talks about the colours of the rainbow in the same clara, pura, multa, obscura language as the De Calora text. And rainbows are rainbows. Rainbows are, are TARDIS. He also says something wonderful. Um, he, and you can, the rainbow is also the key, key as to why he thinks colours live in a three-dimensional space. He says this. He says, if you consider all possible rainbows, in all, pos all colours in the rainbow, all rainbows in different types of cloud, and rainbows illuminated by different colours of sunlight, big yellow sun high in the sky, red sun at, 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 at sunset, then, but only then, when you've considered all those three things changing, will you have found all possible colours. That's interesting. Did anyone ever test this hypothesis? That's a really interesting... In other words, that all possible rainbows you could ever imagine seeing, you would collect all possible colours that way. Uh, that's fascinating. And it turns out that this works. Different cl clouds contain droplets of different size. And here are two artificial rainbows made by a spray. Can you see that the colours in the top one, which is made by bigger droplets near the centre of the spray, are just more intense? They're, they're more what we call saturated. But smaller raindrops, this fine mist that blows to the outside of the cloud, give rise to a weaker colours, less saturated colours. So there, there is an effect with different um, uh, colours. Across the rainbow itself, the different colours is, surprise, surprise, not a type of colour, but that's what Grosseteste means by great and less. That's not what we'd have expected, would it? Uh, uh, is it? Um, that's the pure and impure. So now we can go and have fun. We could do two things. We could either get a massive grant to go all over the world with cameras and wait for rains, uh, rainbows and, and photograph them, um, and they are beautiful and wonderful. Um, however, we couldn't get that grant, we got a small grant, but that would allow us to do the calculations because now one can calculate. One can calculate the colours in a rainbow, and it, but it's not a simple calculation. We need the laws of refraction from glass. We, in fact, we need the laws of refraction not from prisms, but from raindrops, which are quite different. This is what happens in a raindrop. Uh, colours are refracted once from incoming sunlight. They go to the back of the raindrop. They they reflect back from the inside the raindrop from the back, and they refract once more. Um, and different uh, different colours are refracted to different extents, and that's how you get your spectrum. And the, all the raindrops that are sending you the red in the sky have the same angle between the sun coming behind you and the angle coming to your eye, and that's why they're in an arc. Because if I take a protractor, I can do that at the angle, and that, and the blue has a slightly different angle, so that's why I see all the colours. All the all the colours. Uh, so we can do this calculation. That's the calculation of different rainbow colours that get with different droplet radius. What we can then do is to take those colours from different types, points of the rainbow, and from different rainbows for my different droplets, and then we can work out the short, medium, and long wavelength signals from the eye looking at those different colours, and then we can plot that. So we've already got optics, we've got meteorology, we've got, uh, the, we've got the biophysics of the eye, um, and we can plot that into the, uh, the three-dimensional colour space of the eye. And I'll have to play the little movie for you so you can see it's really three dimensions. What we've plotted here are different rainbows with different droplet sizes. Um, 
That's the RGB color cube. Cuely, I've got white, r black at the bottom. I've rotated the cube a bit. White at the bottom and black's at the top. Um, and I've got uh, the red, green, and I've got the blue, yellow axes out to the side. What I want you to see is an object of stunning beauty arises when we do this. Individual rainbows form a spiral in this space. And sets of rainbows um, uh, form a sort of net of spirals. There's our modeling difference, and that's where they are in the, in the space. Isn't that lovely? I just think that's lovely. Um, this whole thing has inspired a new coordinate system for color, which is nearly cylindrical, for those of you who know these radial and, and, and transversal, but it turns out the cylindrical coordinate system, of which some of us will be aware, is only one member of a family of coordinate systems of, sort of sunflower coordinate systems of intersecting spirals. The final thing we have to do that Grosstest tells us to do is to model different solar spectra. Now, the best data on the absorption of sunlight from the atmosphere is held by the Hubble Space Co Telescope team, because they really know. And they shared all their spectra with us, so we were able now to pre-process the light coming into our calculations from different suns. As the sun sets, it gets redder. Okay, and there are all the spectra, I won't go into details here, but there's the spectra of sunlight from the blue sky at top. As the sun sets, you see, of course, the light gets absorbed, it gets fainter, but can you see it also gets pushed towards the red? And that's what, that's what we did. And there is the, are the, the rainbow spirals now pushed into the cube um, uh, by the setting sun, and it's, we've shown the gross test was almost true. All rainbows, colors in all rainbows under all sunlights with all clouds do form a set that a net that covers color space. So there's a paper. In fact, it's two papers in the Journal of the Optical Society of America inspired by questions, wonderful questions that come echoing over 800 years of history in a rainbow spired coordinate system. So, um, so there we are, uh, the gross test science, which is a, starts as a fundamental link between light and matter becomes a combinatorial three-dimensional space of color. He's doing mathematics with color and with nature almost for the first time. He creates a sort of theater in which color can be manipulated and, and that this comes from a palette of the rainbow. And I just want to finish by returning to the, the, the topic that Dee kindly uh, announced, which, which is this book on creativity and imagination. The reason I wanted to write about imagination is because I've heard so, I've heard too many school kids tell me that the reason they're put off science is because they don't think there's room for their own creativity or their own imagination within science. And I wonder what on earth we've done in our science communication to tell them that. How could one do science without reimagining the universe? That's what the science, that's what science is. From the tiniest atom to the biggest galaxy. Um, Gross test in his commentaries about scientific method, writes a beautiful thing about the visual, what I now realize is the visual scientific imagination. He calls it solertia. This is this special word of this human insight into the world. And I can't put it better this way. Solertia, he says, is the penetrating power in virtue of which the mind's eye does not rest on the outer surface of an object, but penetrates to something below the visual image. For instance, when the mind's eye falls on a colored surface, it doesn't rest there, but descends to the physical structure of which the color is an effect. It then penetrates this structure until it detects an elemental qualities, the elemental qualities of which the structure is itself an effect deeper and deeper and deeper into the layers of the onion. This beautiful ability to allow our perception of our mind's eye not to be satisfied by the superficial, the superficies, the surface of the world, but to dive into its structure and make it our own. As Sartre said about art, to, to represent nature as if nature came from the human mind is what I think science and art have in common. Looks, at, in, looks color. Color is light incorporated in perspicuity. We now know what he's thinking of. So, um, so it's, it's recognizing deep medieval philosophical echoes of what I found to be true by talking with artists and scientists today that's meant a whole chapter of this new book um, has uh, medieval philosophers because uh, helping us understand what today's artists and scientists are doing because no one I found has thought perhaps part, perhaps part perhaps uh, uh, apart from Meloponti and a few of the phenomenologists, but no one has really got to where Grosteth got to a long, a long time ago. And what comes out is, is not so much 
artistic thinking and scientific thinking, but mode, different modes of imagination that we all share. The one we've been visiting today is what I call the visual uh, mode of scientific imagination. But there are others. There's a textual mode. That's what brings novels into play and ties them in their life story with, its, with scientific experiment. And then when there are no pictures and no, world, no words, and we expect there to be no imagine at all, imagination at all, that apophatic world is where music and mathematics live. Um, anyway, so that's just a little bit of a taster for the book. But it situates, I hope, what I've talked about today in the larger context of uh, a number of different projects. Thank you so much for listening and inviting me.